Why hello, welcome to another Ronte Long reading vlog. I'm going to start the Tenant of Whiteville haul right now. It is Sunday evening, somewhere in June. As you can see, I've annotated this before and I flipped through it for a bit. And I have also made some notes in my book, so I don't think I'm going to annotate this one again. I do have a marker to, I think, just mark a few pages that I really think speak for Anne's writing. I will make some extra, like, markings for... Things I want to bring up in the live show, things I want to put in this vlog, things I want to put in my notebook. But I don't think I'm going to look for anything specific in the way that I did in the previous vlogs. Because I've already done that, so that feels a bit repetitive and unnecessary. And I just really want to enjoy and experience this book this time around. I really, really loved it the first time I read it. I do remember the first part being not my favorite part of the book. I think the second and third part were more interesting, more engaging. So I have, well, I have my phone in the charger right now, but I'm going to listen to the audiobook while I read on 1.8 or two times speed, kind of depending on how fast the narrator goes. And let's do this. I'm you okay? <laughs> Honestly, thought it was one of my guests. So I have started my reread of The Tenant of Whiteville Hall. I'm exactly on page 100 right now and I'm a little bit bored. I think the first 100 pages are already written for the first time reader because there's a lot of mystery. And I think if you know everything about that mystery, which of course I do because this is a reread, then I think there's not much to get from the first 100 pages. I will still keep this little bit uh, spoilery free, so I will tell you of course a little bit what the Temple of Whiteville Hall is about. So in the first part of the book we meet a young man, the son of a gentleman farmer, who is very much a young man in his early 20s. He is flirting with the vicar's daughter. He tries to find his way in life, he's interested in literature, but he's also really interested in the women around him. Him. He is not that sympathetic within that, I think, because he does cross some lines. Overall, he has good intentions. And then he meets a widow and her young son who move into the village. She is very standoffish towards everyone and her opinions on how to raise her son and just and things in general don't really match how Gilbert's mother, for example, thinks. So she is quite strange. But the fact that we get it from his perspective, it is fun. For me, it was fun the first time around because... We don't know anything about this Mrs. Graham and we slowly get to know her better through Gilbert. But now that I know her whole story, the first 100 pages are a little bit slow. But I've gone through them and I think it won't be long until we switch perspectives and we get, I think, the good part of this book. Because the rest of the book is from the perspective of Mrs. Graham. Which I think generally is something people agree on, that that is the good part of the book, or the better part of the book. Anne's writing is slow, full of just feeling and realism and observation, which 
I am enjoying. I am like, I have to say, I am liking the fact that I'm not actively annotating. It is fun to see my annotations from the first time I read it because I think this is the first book that I've annotated that I'm rereading. So it's a lot of fun to see how I felt um, about the book the first time around, but also the suspicions I had about Mrs. Graham. There are a few things and I noticed that are really funny, like suspicions that Gilbert has that within the context of the truth are very funny. So I do like that there are some Easter eggs in there. And I think Mrs. Graham is almost angelic through Gilbert's eyes. She doesn't feel very real, but then you have to realize, I think, that you look through the eyes of a man. You know, he can't help it. He's a man and he has certain ways of looking at women, of categorizing them in the few boxes that he knows they can be in. Mrs. Graham is someone he has difficulty placing, but he is also denying himself that he has romantic feelings for her, which I think he does right from the beginning, but because she is not a suitable match for him, especially in his mother's eyes, it's not even considered. So it takes a while for him to acknowledge his feelings and the way that is interwoven with jealousy is one of my least favorite scenes in this book because it really raises your doubt over Gilbert as a character but no one has to be perfect but to get a bit of a feeling of uh, Mrs. Graham Gilbert says, I cannot say that I like her much. She is handsome, or rather I should say distinguished and interesting. Too hard, too sharp, too bitter for my taste. I think he describes the vicarage doll, the vicar's daughter as someone who is just lovable. He describes her as, I think, round and perky and just everything that he feels a woman that he should marry should look like. And of course, Mrs. Graham, to her experience, of course, which I will discuss later in this vlog in a spoilery bit. She's, of course, not that. She is very different. And he starts to appreciate that he really likes her for her mind. Like he said, I should say distinguished and interesting. And it's worked upon more later in a novel. Even though Gilbert really has his faults, I really like that. And romantic storylines, like in Agnes Grey as well, really are romantic storylines of the mind. We have these assumptions of people, and I think it's definitely played with in this book. We have this we have these assumptions of what is right and wrong but we never really consider someone's individual situation because one thing can be true for someone and it's not true for another and I really like how that is a theme in this book. Hi, it is Sunday. Very much a Sunday, a sunny Sunday. I'm having a great day so far. It's really relaxing and I've been reading a bit of The Tenant of White Hole this morning. I am currently on page 227. So I think I've read a hundred pages since I last talked to you. We have switched perspectives. We now meet Mrs. Graham whose first name is Helen. We meet her when she it's a young girl and she lives with her uncle and her aunt and she's going to the marriage market marriage market it sounds so disgusting but she is introduced into society i guess just like the bridgerton way it feels very much like that and her aunt is i think one of the wisest people in this book even though she does give some terrible advice because there's this man and helen describes him as a man who is well past 40 who her aunt wants her to marry this man is arrogant himself we meet a lot of different men and i feel like in this part of the book and kind of introduces us into how she views men which i don't think is anything the other Bronte sisters do so elaborate as Anne does it right here and it is definitely one of my favorite parts of the book. So we have this older man who is like a good candidate. Um, he will probably provide Helen with just a not wealthy but just a life with comfort and he is so presumptuous because he can offer that that he doesn't even consider that Helen who is an 18 year old girl might not want to marry him because she doesn't find him attractive. It is so ingrained in him that if he can offer a woman comfort and a certain status then she must love him and he doesn't understand anything of how women love to him it is purely divided men love women because they are attractive that's it and women love men for what they can offer them in his view and i think in the broader view also of her aunt and uncle because they stimulate her to go true of this marriage. It is the belief that for a woman marriage is like getting the job of a lifetime. For men it is find a lovely companion. And of course we know that Helen refuses this man. That's very clear from the very beginning that she has no interest in him. And he just doesn't want to believe it. He thinks she is playing a game of hard to get. Which I feel like unfortunately it is still so relevant that men don't take no for an answer in the most annoying way. And he keeps on pushing and she almost has to scream at him 
the word no, even though that goes beyond what she's comfortable with, beyond what she wants to show of herself as propriety. But Helen is almost an angel in this book, especially in the beginning. She is so naive. She should really listen to her aunt. She gives some good advice. I know later in the book, Helen still kind of stays an angel. And I feel that's very much within the realm of how Anne Ronde writes, which is okay. But she definitely gets tested on her ideas, but she stays so true to herself. And then of course we have the rakes, which um, I just mentioned Bridgerton, but Bridgerton really glorifies rakish behavior. And Bronte definitely does not. We know that Helen is so naive and you know what's going to happen because you know the basic part of this story is that a woman marries an abusive man. If she didn't know that yet, that is basically what this story is about. When she meets him, it is very interesting because she has this whole idea of I can fix him, which again, painfully relevant to how relationships are sometimes portrayed still in books today and in films today. Maybe a little bit more early 2000s than right now. But her naivety is, def is definitely the kind of naivety that we still see today. I'm enjoying the way that Anne Bronte portrays these different type of men. One of the most famous and also stupid lines from Helen is, if I hate the sin, I love the sinner. And that is something I will always remember. That is just a question of do someone's actions speak for them as a person? What can you forgive? What can you not forgive? And how big is the sin? And what does that say about the sinner? I think overall also blaming your bad behavior on faith. Um, like it was meant to be. But you did it yourself. So I think that is such a deep and layered quote. That really describes a lot of things in this book. So we have this man who we know she's going to marry because we know that, that he is going to be her abusive husband. And of course she does fall in love with him for certain reasons. But that is how mainly the rakes and the bad men in these times and earlier as well. And Jane Austen as well other scribe. That they really put on a different mask, a different face. And then the women fall in love and slowly we get to know who they really are. I think of course other people saw it before but the first time Helen sees it and she gets a little bit suspicious. I might have thought so once but now I say give me the girl I love and I will swear eternal constancy to her and her alone through summer and winter through youth and age and life and death if age and death must come. So that is this man saying how he feels about love and I think making Helen fall in love with him. And then one sentence later it says, but the minute after he changed his tone, that is already giving away that he didn't really mean it, that it's not really who he is. And there are lots of little hints in this book. I feel like maybe this is the time in the vlog where I should talk spoilers because I feel if I don't then I cannot properly explain my thoughts. So I will. I will talk spoilers. So just so you know if you have not read this book yet, if you are intrigued and you haven't read it, please leave me a comment down below if you're going to read it. Otherwise I will see you when I've read more of The Tenant of Whiteville Hall. <laughs> volume 2 of the Senate Fight the whole meaning I am not using my bookmark. I am around page 350 and it is Tuesday and we have the live show on Sunday. So I do have a little bit of reading to do. So I am now talking spoilers and if you've read volume 2 you know this is where everything just explodes. Arthur does so many things that are just vile and disgusting. And this is also the moment where Helen becomes more of a character, where Helen becomes more human, where there is more space for her passion. And I think she kind of goes from angel to human being, to human woman. The word sin is used a lot. I think I discussed the quote, I hate the sin, but I love the sinner. I know very little about Christianity. And was a devoted Christian. So I think I should get to know more about 
what sins are and what they were in end's time and i think how if you have been raised within christianity if that is very important to you in end's context and time how would you go about making a violent man how would you go about describing him in your book because i think what n does and i'm not sure how much i'm loving that but what n does is she has arthur he's evil she has helen she's good of course there's more play within that later in the novel and we will talk about that because that's really interesting i think but of course how would you do that if you are a devout christian if that is how you uh, have learned to judge people you use the seven deadly sins I think if you are going to use quotes like um, I hate the sin, things like that, there was this other quote where Helen was really judging Arthur for bringing all this upon himself. There's this one scene where he has a hangover and she says, you're not sick, there's nothing wrong with you. All that you do, you afflict upon yourself. I'm paraphrasing. And then eventually she says, perhaps then I was too severe in my judgment for I abhor the sinner as well as the sin. Those kind of wording is constantly repeated. I started to kind of... Again, I know very little about Christianity, but I think without a little bit of knowledge about it, it can be hard to understand the depth of this book. And it's also, I think, hard to understand Anne's writing motivation. So you have uh, greed, lust, gluttony, raw, fright, envy, and sloth. And I have made a little list and I have looked up some quotes and Arthur is guilty on all of those and not just that you can kind of think about it but you can actually pinpoint in a book the moments where Anne has a moment where she has a description where she chooses to write a scene in which he sins one of the deadly sins so there's one quite shocking i think scene where they're still kind of early in their marriage and they're still in love they still have love for each other and Helen gives birth to their son and as soon as their son is born she has of course new mother has a lot of attention for her son she needs to make sure that he's okay especially in this time where you had a lot of infant mortality she is just really focused on his son and he gets incredibly jealous of or envious of the attention that the son is getting and he calls him during the Bronte long wave notes that they're notorious for really weird nicknames let's see what Arthur calls his son the first time he meets him a little worthless idiot just father of the year but there's a force gluttony is one of his biggest vices because of course he's an alcoholic and of course wrath is something we're getting because Helen is very clear at some point that she does not want to be with Arthur anymore that she does not want to be in a marriage anymore and that she wants to leave she even asks him permission to leave and that is where his pride comes in because he doesn't want people to talk he just cannot believe that helen would choose anything but to be with him um and of course lost because of course he has an affair that helen finds out and a parallel you can see within that is that Arthur is looking at the trees and that there are three people in the garden. Arthur is standing in the garden and Helen comes up to him, gives him a hug. And he expects to see his mistress. And there is a scene with Gilbert as well when there are three people in the garden. And we have Helen and her brother having a conversation and Gilbert um, through the trees as well. I think he is spying on them, listening to what they have to say. It's all like a cluster of misunderstanding. Of course, Helen totally knows what is going on later on, but that point, I think, is kind of repeated. This is a feminist masterpiece, this book. It's an absolute feminist masterpiece, but I think Anne is at her strongest when she writes realism. There are a few attempts, I think, at symbolism in this book. One example is where they are playing chess. I think the chess is kind of an embodiment of how the plot is going to go, the chess play. I don't think it's done very well. I don't enjoy the symbolism in this book or the attempts at it because I just don't think that is where Anne's strength lay when she wrote this book. But sometimes I also forget that all the Bronte books or at least um, Anne and Emily's were written when they were in their 20s. Which makes me sad because how many classics that we read now that have this big image that we all admire so much were written by people who are in their 20s. It's not a whole lot. I mean, Dickens' greatest novels, he was not in his 20s. So sometimes I think when we are critical of certain things in the Bronte novels, when we compare them to certain other books, I think we forget their age. 
is just something I wanted to put out there. One thing I also really did want to discuss is the female solidarity in this book, which I think is why it translates so well to modern times, this book, because we have Millicent and we have Helen, who both marry uh, two men who are terrible, who are violent, and they, their men, uh, exist in the same friendship group. I think Anne used Millicent both as a tool to have conversations about what it means to be an adult woman because they really have an open conversation about that, just the two of them, about what it means to be an adult, what it means to be married, and really goes beyond the engagement level where we see a lot of other heroines live, which I really appreciated. But she also uses Millicent and her violent husband, I think, in two ways. In one way to say that Arthur is not the exception, but the rule. And that the culture of men within the friendship group and within society as a whole, I think, is wrong. Just how it's wrong and how the power imbalance is so unproductive and so violent and destructive. And in another way, I think, but we're going to have to see what I remember is that Millicent's husband, he does reform and there are some differences between him and Arthur. But yes, I know that there are a lot of things are still about to happen in volume 3. I am definitely enjoying this more for the realism and for the fact that it's just, it's a feminist masterpiece. However you want to value the book at, in its literary value, for which I can see that books like Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights have maybe more value. They are not the feminist masterpiece that this is. And I know that people like to call Jane Eyre a feminist masterpiece and definitely have more potential in understanding different layers of feminism than Charlotte did. That's where I'm at right now and I'm going to do more reading and chat to you about the book once I have finished it. It is five minutes before the reading sprints are starting and can you hear it? We're getting the biggest thunderstorm. I saw the birds like flying out the houses so I know I knew something was going to happen. Oh but it's been so hot today. This is so nice. I mean you can just see how sticky I am. They say you should close your window when it's storming, but it feels so nice and I don't want to. But I will, because I'm sitting here with the laptop. Yesterday evening during the reading sprints, I finished The Tent of Ice for Hall. Even though this book is not romantic at all, the end kind of is. And I have to applaud Anne for making a tragic and very layered book with a very difficult, not a difficult character, but a difficult situation with a character in a very difficult situation. And to give it a romantic ending, usually also with a lot of books I really love, characters, female characters who somehow break the rules always get punished for it in a way that they either die or become a very unhappy spinster. Helen has two options. She becomes either a happy spinster her with her son and her aunt or she becomes a married woman both of which are in Helen's view happy endings and I just really enjoy a Victorian novel with a happy ending of course and made sure that Helen did was somehow acceptable because she had such a good reason and we were talking during the live show yesterday that this book does drag a little bit but I think it is because Anne was being so brave in writing the way she did and that she really took a lot of time to just justify Helen's actions for a Victorian reader. I gave this a 4.5 star. The beginning is definitely a bit slow and I didn't enjoy the first 100 pages that much. So I think therefore, and just for some more objective ways to look at the novel, how the novel is built, um, just the writing, stylish choices, I think it's not a five star. But this book is such an act of bravery and it makes me really sad that it wasn't available for such a long time and that it was edited until I think the 90s. And of course it is so sad that Charlotte was the one who created that, who stopped the publication of Temple of Whitefall, who edited it. And I know that Charlotte didn't like this book, but maybe it was because she tried to protect her sister because of course when this came out it was on a pseudonym of a man. I really like what Anne says in the preface of the second edition. Um, when someone says that she must be a woman to write this. I make no effort to refute it because in my own mind I am satisfied that if a book is a good one it is so whatever the sex of the author may be. And isn't that 
the truth. I will see you in the live show. I think I will upload this on the same day as the live show actually. So the live show will be I think in a few hours when I upload this. And we'll talk more about them to fight for the live show is fully spoilery. But of course if you've gotten this far in the vlog then I guess that is okay. Our next read will be Shirley by Charlotte Bronte. Which will be the first book that is not a reread for me. And I am super super excited. If you want to join us for the Bronte long for Shirley Fillette and a professor that we have still left. All the information is in the description down below. We have a discord and we do a live show at the end of the two months um, although the professor just has the one month thank you so much for watching i hope that you have a lovely lovely day or evening and i hope to see you in another video doei